So, uh, the next speaker is an embedded system engineer at One Variable. He has worked in several fields ranging from critical abilities to Internet of Things. Actually, he's primarily helping our companies with development in the RAS program language. He's going to present about his RAS power and for the system. So, uh, please, let's give a, a round of applause for James Mans. So, uh, here. I'm trying to things so I can share my screen. Yeah, probably. Um, I think if you want to. Yeah, normally mm -hmm. you put on there. Uh, I have USB-C or I have HDMI. Do we have a USB to USB-C? Yes. 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 For... Oh, for the clicker? Uh, I have HDMI. Uh, for the, yeah. For the... No, no, everything's good. You need one for the uh, no for the um, ah. audio and the camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, that's the machine, right? Okay, cool. Cool. Yes. you're recording everything, right? Okay. I can say it here, but not a problem. Am I on it? Ah, here. Hello. Okay. We're going to add speed to the IT. There's a box somewhere I can see. contributors in Berlin quite a number of years ago, <laughs> but haven't actually kept up with it too much other than what I've been trying to catch up with on the past weeks to make sure I don't sound too silly, but I'm going to be talking about a different operating system. So this is a NAMAS, which is a, a I'm going to bail on this, but I'm, uh, which is a hobby operating system. So I've been working on uh, NAMAS for a little over a year and a half now. Um, I do a lot of embedded systems consulting and a lot of odd projects, and quite often I find myself uh, needing something a little bit more than an individual operating system. So Namas has become my sort of test lab for a lot of the other stuff that I do. So either throwing things into Namas or playing around with it there and extracting it out. Um, so the name, which everyone has trouble pronouncing, it comes from a Namosity, who's the Greek goddess of memory. I figured for an operating system, managing memory was pretty important. So I went with that. Uh, if you need to remember how to pronounce it, it's like mnemonic, same word root, memory. Um, and like I said, it's not an obvious operating system. You are all incredibly smart people, and you will be able to look through my claims and hopes and dreams and say, you didn't think about that, and you will be right. 
Um, and if you want to come talk to me about it, I would love to talk to you about it. But don't uh, don't approach this from a perspective of poking holes in what I've done because there's lots of holes. Um, but I'd love to talk to you about sort of what I have in mind and uh, what it could be, maybe. So don't overthink it. And as a hobby project, it doesn't always have to make sense or be the best or most efficient way of approaching things. Because for hobby projects, the most important thing is that you keep coming back to them. Because if you don't keep coming back to them, then they die. So hobby projects have to be a little bit fun. So you keep showing up and making it better over a pretty extended amount of time. Um, so first, a little context. Luckily, we're in a room full of embedded developers primarily. So you probably don't need this slide. But in my opinion, uh, embedded systems usually come in one of two flavors. Um, the big option, which is embedded Linux. These are typically your gateways, but also sometimes standalone devices all the way up to displays in cars or other vehicles and things like that. And there's a ton of different ways to make them and different companies prefer different things, but this is the big option. And quite often, if you start with the big option, you usually have to start shaving it down to be as small as it can be so that it fits whatever you're actually doing. And the other option is to start from the bottom and come up to all of the functionality that you need. And again, there are tons and tons of different options up here, ranging from bare metal to Riot OS to you name it. There's been a bunch of slides with everyone's different OS and HAL offerings and all the different ways that you can make an embedded system from a uh, scratch. And like I said, I do a lot of prototyping and consulting and stuff like that. And there are some things that Linux is just better for or easier for. When you have complex networking, you want to SSH into the device, you want to write something to a file, you want to use software you found off the internet because it's exactly what you need. You want to be able to hire developers, like a lot of them, or reasonably find them quickly. Um, Linux is really good for all of those things. And similarly, bare metal or R2S applications are just better for some stuff. If you want to make sure that you can read a sensor and turn off a motor so that if you stick your arm into a spinning blade that the blade will stop by the time that your hand hits those blades, you probably don't want Linux. You probably want a real-time operating system that will respond in a, a guaranteed amount of time that is larger than the difference between your finger and the blade. Um, also, if you want to do something with custom hardware or you really want to audit or customize what you're doing, um, I'm not a Linux kernel developer. Um, I'm sure there are some very smart ones who would say, oh, it's so easy to build a driver for a custom piece of hardware. I find doing that in bare metal systems way easier than trying to write a Linux kernel driver. That's my personal bias, though. And it's all software. You could do all of this in either of them. I'm sure there are geniuses out there that could build everything that I described in Linux on a bare metal system or the other way around. But for me personally, some tools are just easier to start with and trying to do something beyond that tool can often be somewhat painful. However, people pay me to do a lot of projects right in the middle of that. And then it's always a challenge. Do I start from nothing and build up or do I start from Linux and build down? I tend to need sort of a grab bag of both files. I usually want my devices to be networked. I want them to use a bunch of software that's already out there. I usually need some custom hardware. So I've always found myself in a weird position where I have to pick one and it's never terrifically pleasant. Um, so that's why I'm building NAMAS, is I see NAMAS as an operating system for that liminal space in between the two other options. So if you've ever walked through like an airport and there's a long hallway from one terminal to the other, that's a liminal space. It's a space that you're not really meant to stay in. It's just for getting you from one place to another. And I find this middle ground for embedded systems to be sort of that liminal space. Everyone expects that you're going to be in one or the other, but I think probably it's worth setting up shop right there in the middle because I'm not the only one that hangs out there more often than not. But on the other hand, unlike a real-time operating system, I'm designing the MOS to be an operating system for small computers, which means not just uh, an appliance or something that you're building and deploying and never changing over time, it should be easy to update the software on it or uh, run custom user programs, if you'd like, or those kind of things. And that's something that Linux does really well, but real-time operating systems don't do super well. But that small word is pretty important, too, because I'm talking about either very large microcontrollers or very small Linux-type CPUs. 
which uh, also can be fairly challenging to address from either direction. And because it's my hobby project, it fits all of my favorite choices. Um, being able to not say I'm not going, or being able to say I'm not going to support a uh, microcontroller with 2K of RAM, you have fun with that. But if you want to come play with this, you probably need like a couple hundred kilobytes of RAM or a CPU that has 32 bits and things like that. And there's lots of use cases that this doesn't fit, but for this project, I don't particularly mind if I don't cover them. Um, also, hand through the light curtain. Probably not going to handle that. This is a, a more play computer. So soft real time is probably enough. And also, I am shamelessly willing to steal any good idea from the last 55 years of computer science, whether that's in embedded systems or not in embedded systems. If people have had a good idea somewhere and I can use it, I'm going to. So what did I steal? And by that, I mean what design choices did I make? Well, the first one is an async first operational model. So uh, the embedded systems folks will probably know this better as cooperative multitasking. This means that rather than having a bunch of threads where you stop the world and swap time in between of them, you expect all the code to be generally polite. And when it has something to do, it does it. And when it doesn't, it doesn't sit there waiting around for something like this. Um, and this is used in a bunch of places. Async await in Rust is exactly this. Async IO in Python. Nginx, I'm in the room, right room of people. How many people know what proto threads are? A couple of Kentucky users back in the day. Proto threads are a bonkers way of doing async first operation on a microcontroller, uh, abusing C macros. And it all sort of works if you hold it right, but it also is very weird if you don't. And yeah, uh, these are all async first operational models, but some of them are more reasonable to use than others. And the reason why I chose this is because most hardware is usually event driven. You're waiting for a button, you're waiting for a packet, you're waiting for a transfer to complete or something like that. And when you're not playing a video game or crunching numbers or things like that, you're very rarely CPU bound. You're usually spending all of your time waiting for something. Um, this is true for web servers and embedded systems in my uh, opinion as well. And it also means that you can be fairly power and resource friendly because Things happen when they need to, and they don't happen when they don't need to. And when they don't need to happen, you can go to sleep, which is pretty nice for embedded systems. I've also decided to use message passing as the primary interface style. Bunch of languages going from Erlang to Smalltalk to just if you've ever written backend services for a company or something like that, most of the time you're just sending messages from one node to another. Um, and this has a couple of other interesting sort of flavors to it, isn't it? you're less worried about how a system call works, and you're more worried about, I'm gonna send this message somewhere else, and I'm gonna get some kind of response back. Uh, this makes abstraction fairly easy because you stop caring how you do that call and just what kind of call you're going to do. And since I already said I'm using async, message passing works great with that because you can stick messages in queues or channels and things like that, and you can get notifications when your response comes back which means it plays really well with that first async choice. And like I said about not caring where the message came from, what if you didn't have to know whether the message that you're receiving came from someone else in the terminal, whether it came from user space, or it came over the network from another device? Because if you're writing a service that just handled messages, you don't really care where it came from other than security and firewall type things. You just say, I got a request, I service it, and I send a response back. And these days, deserialization or serialization can be really, really ridiculously fast. Uh, computers are good at this, and we've come up with a lot of very good protocols that are very quick at this. Now, I don't know the theory name for this, maybe like a completion and submission queue or something like that, but Linux has this cool thing called IOD ring, which, and Windows has a version called IFCP, which is unlike normal system calls where you say, I would like to receive TCP data now. And you pull the emergency stop and stop the entire thread so that the kernel can come in and give you some TCP data. And if you have a bunch of things that you'd like to do, you have to be stopping and doing system calls all the time. You have sort of like a conveyor belt where everything that you'd like to happen, you put a note on the conveyor belt, and eventually the kernel will come back around the other side and your delivery will be there, which means if you'd like to wait on 10 or 20 or 100 things at the same time, you just put all those requests on the conveyor belts, and then eventually they come back. Now, this is awesome for async, because again, 
most of your time, you're just waiting for something and requests to the kernel are, can just be something that you wait to. And when we already serialized all of our requests, hey, great, we can just use a ring buffer between user space and the kernel and start putting those messages in as messages on the conveyor belt and get a conveyor belt of bytes coming back the other direction, which means you really only need one stop the world system call, yield, which is I have literally nothing else to do. Wake me when you've sent me something back. And a lot of times you don't even ever need to do that because every time the operating system preempts you because you have a driver event or something like that, it has an opportunity to work on some of those requests that came in. And you may not have ever, might not ever need to actually stop the world because you just keep getting stuff coming back on that conveyor belt as far as you're concerned. And again, I have a great like uh, research name for this, but I've, I've just been calling it flexible kernel setups or make the operating system a library, not a distribution. Um, BSD rump kernels do this. C++ has a project called Include OS. But the idea is take all the, the things that you provide as an operating system and make them as packages so that people can choose which ones they want and how they integrate them, which means you can have some setups where you say, well, I'm not going to take the user space library. I am a uh, sort of fully compiled together operating system environment, and I want to share the scheduler and the communication privileges uh, and the network stack and stuff like that, but I don't need all that user space stuff. So you can have very tiny devices speak the same language and the same development process as your very large devices that are going to run user applications and things like, like that. And like I said, this makes it very things without having to know exactly what your end device is. You can run them on 32-bit microcontrollers or big 64-bit CPUs, or you can let someone who's porting the software to that device make the choices about like, what do my drivers need to look at? Or what do my drivers need to look like? Because they know that platform better, so they just are responsible for gluing their implementation details to these operating system libraries. And I think that computers are not really just computers. Your computers, like your laptop or your phone and things like that, are actually a network of computers. You've got dozens of CPUs in every computer you've ever sat in front of. So why don't we start treating those systems as if they were distributed systems and not just one main CPU with a lot of black boxes? Because nowadays you get a ton of CPUs in one package. All Winner uh, released this processor earlier this year, and they've got uh, three different CPU architectures on one piece of silicon. Uh, you've got a 64-bit RISC-V CPU, an Extensa LX7 DSP, and a Cortex-M processor for doing, I, I don't know, whatever you want to do in your processor. And most Linux systems just present this as, ah, you're running on the main CPU, don't think about those other ones. But what if you could? And what if you maybe ran three copies of the OS on all the different cores of your operating system? And even if you don't have them all in the same silicon, think about your main CPU that talks to a GPU and a Wi-Fi controller, an Ethernet controller. They're nowadays probably all 32-bit CPUs with a decent amount of RAM and capable of doing scheduling, and they're going to be doing scheduling, even if you didn't write that code. Why not be able to talk to them as sort of more like peers rather than a black box that you have to use a vendor library for? And I think this is one of those areas where we can steal a lot of things because people have been building distributed systems for backend servers and things like that for decades now. And why not see all of their great ideas and uh, treat it like a real network? Okay, so I've just pitched you a lot of wonderful things and it sounds great, I am sure. But what actually works today is versus just like what's slideware? Well, the kernel basics definitely work. We have memory allocation. We have that async cooperative scheduler in the kernel that I talked about. All of this message passing that I've talked about, particularly strongly typed messaging, which means you're not just sending bytes between different services, you're sending strongly typed data. And uh, service discovery, which means you can just boot up and as a service, you say, give me the serial port, please. And it will either say, yes, here's your serial port. It will say, we don't have one of those. So you're able to decouple how different services work with each other because you just say, look, I want a serial port. If you have one, give it to me. If not, we'll figure it out. Um, so this is what the basics of a, a kernel service looks like. So this is on that 64-bit RISC-V processor. Don't worry if you don't speak Rust. 
So the big picture is when you register the service, you say, look, I'm going to allocate the resources I need, like a bi-directional byte channel, because I need to send and receive serial data. And then you say the operating system, uh, our model is a lot like opening up a TCP socket. You open up a socket, which allows you to accept incoming connections, and then you establish these connections with whoever you connect with. So you open up that socket, you say, I can accept up to four sockets. Um, please let me know, here's a stream of requests for connections. Then you go ahead and you spawn your um, serial worker tasks, so whatever's gonna take that outgoing data and turn those into DMA requests and spit those out a couple chunks at a time. And then the other side, you say, uh, give this resources to the interrupt, because whenever serial data comes in, I'll get an interrupt. I drain that FIFO, give it over to the software and things like that. Um, and then you just say, okay, I have spawned the service for serial ports. And now whenever someone asks for the serial port, anyone who asks for specifically a, let's see, a simple serial service will get you. It's like opening a socket to this service. Uh, we have some creature comforts in an operating system. We have some user interfaces. We have a fourth scripting language. How many people know fourth? Okay, about the same as proto threads. That's about what I expect. And this is where that slide said steal from the last 55 years. Uh, fourth was released in 1970. So I couldn't just say 50 on that slide. It had to be 55 because it's now been 53 years. Um, we have some tricks for multiplexing UARTs and uh, tracing, uh, sending structured tracing data. So we're not just getting log messages from the kernel. We're also getting uh, more detailed data. I'll show you that on the slide. So this is our user interface. Uh, we're using a little black and white display. So this is our simulator um, showing an interactive fourth shell where we're running all of these things. The fun one is actually here where sleep is a system call. So we say asynchronously, I would like to sleep for this amount of time. And instead of blocking the whole CPU, the scheduler says, cool, I'll wait for you in three seconds. Um, this is that structured tracing I was talking about. Rather than just having log lines, we actually get where in the code it's from, what service was going on, detailed about th detailed info about things like what connection ID you have, what service kind is that. Those kind of things. So if anyone's used to structured tracing versus log-based tracing, we have a very compact binary structured tracing format. So we, we ported this to a couple devices. Like I said, our main device right now is this all winner D1, which is a 64-bit risk 5 CPU. It's like the perfect example of that really big for real-time operating systems, little tiny for Linux, like it's one gigahertz at single core, it's a half a gig of RAM. You totally could run Linux on it. It would be ridiculous to run an RTOS on it, but that class of devices is sort of what I think the sweet spot is here. We've also ported it to other devices like the ESP32C3, as well as x 64 and Kimu, because we could, um, which is fine. And we also have a couple of simulators, one that's native, that works fairly similar to the uh, Riot native port, where it runs locally in a pro process and pretends to have all of these things attached to it. We also even got it ported to Wasm. So there's a link on our GitHub page where you can just go to your browser and load the operating system in a tab. Um, and we support real hardware. This is a piece of hardware called the BB by SPFMI or Beeper. They took some wonderful old stock Blackberry keyboards as well as this uh, sharp memory display, which is the same one they have in that Playdate uh, game console, just a black and white 400 by 240 display. Um, but this is the kernel running on the device, running a fourth shell. It talks to the uh, keyboard. It talks over the UART. We're pulling logs off that wonderful bundle of wires going off to the right side. But um, this is something we have running on real hardware because that's the fun part. We want to be able to sit down and play with what we're building, not just spend all of our time refactoring code. Um, so what's next? Uh, Right now we're working on overhauling the message passing system. Before we did sort of a weird one request, one response model, and we realized once you want this to work between multiple systems, we figured out that following the TCP style is actually way easier, like establishing connections, you have bi-directional connections. So right now we're sort of overhauling our, our message passing system. There's a lot of people here who have strong opinions about writing constrained network stacks. I would love to talk to every single one of you before I leave this week. Um, like I said, working on the inter-system communication protocol, things like routing, things like figuring out what these links are, whether you're over a UART or S2C or SPI. 
And uh, I totally broke a user space a couple months ago. So we've got to bring user space back um, so that we can start running user programs again. But we wanted to make sure all of this guts of message passing was working before we decided to actually unbreak all those things. Uh, if you want to play with this, there's our main development website with our docs at nuance.dev. Uh, here we are on GitHub. There's a link to our matrix. Um, the slides are published on the Riot website, so you don't have to write this down. You can just click the links there. Uh, but we'd love to come talk to you, or we'd love to have you come talk with us. Uh, even if you're not interested in working in us or talking about this, it's just, we're, it's a group of people who would like talking about operating system things. So if you find yourself short of those kind of people to talk to in your life, <laughs> come chat with us. Uh, but yeah, thanks. That was Moss, and uh, I'm James. And if you have any questions, I'd love to talk to you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Is there a prevention aside from uh, IRT? Sorry, can you repeat that? Is there, is there a preemption in the thread aside from the IRQ or is there just a um, corporate? So right now the kernel, probably for the foreseeable future, will only be cooperative. So only interrupts uh, interrupt you while you're in the kernel. The plan is to have uh, preemptive scheduling for user space applications. So if you want to have a bunch of concurrent user space applications, those can be uh, uh, preempted. But for the kernel, the idea is as long as we can get away with it, the plan is to keep only the cooperative scheduler because it simplifies a lot of things. Yeah. Very cool question. Thanks. Uh, how much can you make use of the existing Rust space for drivers when it's looking at things? Yeah, so that's the cool thing um, entirely. Um, so there's a lot of async drivers out there for, there's another Rust project called Embassy, which is an async first Rust, uh, it's not an operating system, it's more like a vibe, I don't know. They, uh, <laughs> it's not like a whole package operating system, but it's a lot of drivers and it's a scheduler. Um, but you can use their drivers with our scheduler. And it means that uh, when you when we use something like that ESP32 C3, we didn't rewrite all of our drivers for that. We just used embassy drivers because they're already there and already async. And you just have to sort of wire those up to talk to the messaging uh, service interface. So that when you want to send serial data, you just have to do that sort of gluing of existing drivers into the style of talking that we do. So the answer is if you have an async REST driver already, uh, you can pretty much just use it as is. Answers uh, 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 so maybe for you it was an obvious choice, but for others maybe like that. I mean, the explanation would be nice. Hey, was it obvious for you to use Rust as base language for this? Uh, or, you know, like what? Why did you make this choice? And like, do you any any comments on that? Like, yeah, for sure. So I've been involved with embedded Rust uh, since embedded Rust has generally been a thing. So Rust released in like 2015. Embedded Rust, we put together a working group in the compiler for getting embedded system support going in about 2018. I've been involved since about 2018. So actually, almost like 95% of all the work that I've done since like 2018 has been in Rust. So for me, it was a choice because it's my primary daily language. I have a lot of other opinions on why I think Rust is a really excellent language for embedded systems, as well as uh, well anything that you would use C or C++ for generally. Um, and usually the downsides are there isn't existing code that I'd like to use, but for a hobby project, I would like to write all of that non-existent code. So for me, it was a very clear choice. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to talk more generally about considering Rust versus not Rust for embedded systems and things like that. But I think it's a language that makes a ton of sense, especially because it has native async await support. And like I said, I think embedded systems just are asynchronous environments. And so I think it fits really, really well for that. Thank you. Yeah, I think one more question again. Yeah, so thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I have two questions actually. Uh -huh. uh, the first one is how does it relate to Top OS? I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's also a Rust based operating system for embedded devices. And one interesting thing about Top is that it offers a lot of isolation. So, almost like Rust memory safety. 
Have you already mentioned that we broke a user space several times. So is there like a distinction between kernel and user space in your operating system as well? Yeah. So what it has related to talk OS, um, they both use Rust. That's fine. Um, so talk is very much a, a classical um, real time operating system. It's kind of special sauce, like you mentioned, is it has sort of like a containerization type world where the idea is that you can write drivers that live in pods that can talk to each other and you have system calls that go in between devices. So um, sort of similar in that direction and that it's sort of message passing with E, but it's much closer to a classical real-time operating system and most things are intended to be stacked. You can update pods, but they're not necessarily meant to be like dynamically updated or anything like that. It's, it's much more, it's much closer to Ride OS or something like that than Linux, for example. Um, Second question, uh, isolation in user space. Yeah, so uh, I mentioned that there's like three main ways I want to use Namas. One is like the totally statically linked run run kernel, and that's for very tiny devices like RP2040, where you statically compile everything together, and it's a lot like an embedded system. You just happen to be using all of my user space and communication libraries. Second one would be something where you have like zero or one applications, where you do have a firm line between user space and the kernel, um, and I have this imagined for mostly devices that have an MPU, but not an MMU, where remapping is not a thing you can do, but you can do isolation. So the kernel would still have that MPU isolation, um, but it's not going to run multiple applications because it can't like swap them in and out or page them or whatever. And then for more full featured devices like RISC-V CPUs or ARM Cortex-A devices where you have an MMU, the idea is to really use the MMU to isolate the kernel from user space and different user space applications from each other minus the message passing link, which you might do like firewalling and filtering on to make sure that only certain devices can talk to certain other, or certain applications can talk to certain services and things like that. Does that answer what you were looking for? I actually had a quick question. <laughs> so it's about the simulator that you mentioned. Can you talk a bit more about that? So just like the right was five simulator, or was it just like the right native product that attempts to execute the current like 68 box yeah, so it runs completely, it doesn't do emulation like Q. Um, it is really just running in an operating system thread. So it runs the scheduler inside of uh, a thread. And then if you want to simulate things like a, a serial port, you run that in another thread. And you uh, be sort of a cheat and say something like, oh, apparently I have muted myself. I apologize. I apologize. Yes, um, but no, it's but no, 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 um, I'm sure that might not not now the time, time, but when you want to see it, uh, there are really easy to go pull down the remote, carve a well, and you can develop a network folder, and it'll put it up with the uh, simulator with the display, and you can type it into it and stuff like that. If you really want to play around, it's there on the board. Okay, I think I'm going to kick that out. Thank you very much. I have a lot of stickers and stuff. Please come talk to me. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me.